In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, beautiful saints of Christ Church. Wonderful to be with you today uh, during this uh, second Sunday in Lent. And if you'll hold on, I'm going to open us with the collect of the day. All right. Uh, happy second Sunday of Lent to everyone. Let us pray. <clears throat> oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy. Be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Friends, great to be with y'all today. Uh, Father Matt here, and I'm excited about delving into um, our second class going through the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, I have tried to emphasize with, with you guys that the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is one book. And so that's the way I'm approaching us, this class. Uh, and today, God willing, I'm gonna talk for about 40 minutes, maybe 45 minutes. In fact, I'm gonna set my iPhone timer right now. I'm gonna do better than I did last time. Uh, I'm gonna set my iPhone timer right now. And, um, and, and God willing, we're gonna get through the book of Ezra today, okay? In other words, we're gonna get up through um, Ezra chapter 10, but right now I want to share my screen with you guys. Uh, hopefully you can see my desktop now. And what I want to do, um, what I want to do is pull up my outline, uh, for this class. Hopefully it is saved. Actually, there it is right there. Um, and hopefully y'all can see this on my screen. Um, I'm going to make it a little bigger for you. Whoops. See if I can make it a little bigger. Uh, we'll do 175. There we go. Hopefully y'all can see that. Um, and I wanted to open up like this. Um, last time I, I really enjoyed that class. Um, Thankfully, this time I'm not uh, filming this in the middle of a snow apocalypse. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but I did, despite the fact that it was a snow apocalypse uh, in our last class, um, I, I still enjoyed it. Now, this the, the sad part is, is that uh, I think I dropped the ball a little bit on Zoom and there were a couple of slides that I discussed but was not able to show you. Um, I failed to show you these. And this is the first slide that I wanna make sure that you see this time. This is kind of a visual representation of the Tanakh. Uh, we talked about the Tanakh last time. You can see that word Tanakh right here. That's kind of a, a transliteration of these three Hebrew letters, the Tav, the Nun, and the Kof, I believe. Tanakh, and, and those three letters are the first letters of the words Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. In other words, the teaching or the law, the prophets, and the writings. And the reason we talked about this last time is because of Luke 22, 24, 44. Luke 24, 44, in, in which Jesus on the road to Emmaus looks at his disciples whose eyes have just been opened in the breaking of the bread. He looks at his disciples and he says, didn't you know that all of the Torah the law and the Psalms must be fulfilled by me. And what we see Jesus doing there is invoking this very ancient, but also medieval threefold division of the Hebrew Bible into these three parts, the Torah or the law, the Nevi'im or the prophets and the Ketuvim or the writings. Although Jesus refers to that third part as Psalms. He talks about the law, the prophets and the Psalms, but it's the same thing. Uh, there were other people in the ancient world who referred to that third part as the Psalms and not the writing. So it's he's doing the same thing. And the whole point 
is that as we read and study the book of Ezra and Nehemiah together, we want to keep in mind um, that for Jesus and the apostles, so last time we talked about uh, 2 Timothy 3.15, I believe, um, for Jesus and the apostles, um, the entire Old Testament points forward to Christ. Now, there's lots of different parts of the Old Testament, and each part, each book, each chapter uh, points to Jesus in a unique way. Part of what we want to do in our class on Ezra and Nehemiah, part of what we want to do is uh, think about the specific ways in which Ezra and Nehemiah points forward to Christ. So that's one of the things we're going to be trying to, to do today. But I wanted to show you that slide because I forgot it last time. Um, the other slide that I think that I failed to show you in a good way um, is this one. This one right here. Uh, today, later on, later on today, we're going to get to chapter ten of Ezra, where Ezra discuss, uh, where we see this covenant renewal service, this covenant renewal service of Ezra chapter 10. And, um, and uh, that this is uh, a medieval rendering of that scene in the Bible. I talked a little bit about it last class. It's by um, a wood engraver named Julius Schnur. And you can read about it right here. Um, I'm not gonna read about it this time, but this is contained in uh, Die Bibel in Bildern, the Bible in Pictures, which was published in Leipzig um, in the 19th century. Okay, so y'all can read about that. That's from the Visual Commentary on Scripture website, the vcs.org, super cool um, website that, that portrays scripture through historical painting and art. Really neat stuff. Okay, y'all, um, that takes care of my first bullet point under review from last time. Look at the second bullet point with me. Last time we saw uh, the return of the exiles to Jerusalem. Um, that happened under the good king Cyrus. Cyrus is portrayed, I believe, as a good king here in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. So we see the, the return of the exiles to Jerusalem. We see the erection of the altar and the initial temple itself. And then thirdly, we see an ambiguous response. Um, we see an ambiguous response, um, especially as the older folks in the community, the ones who could remember back to Solomon's temple. Uh, whenever these older folks looked at this new temple that, that had been constructed and probably not finished, but at least the shell of it was constructed and it was standing on its foundation, um, when they looked at this new temple built by Zerubbabel, um, they were underwhelmed. Some, some of them were underwhelmed. Some of them uh, were filled with a kind of sadness because it just seemed to them like the presence of the Lord was not there in the same way that it was in the time of Solomon's temple. Now, what are we to make of this? Well, um, I think it's very interesting that, 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 that there's all sorts of places in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, possibly exclusively, exclusively the Old Testament, where um, there's a kind of ambiguity. There's a kind of ambiguity that is portrayed, and it's not always clear uh, that God, that God, that God's mission is being accomplished. That 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 the, I mean, in some ways, it's very obvious, right? Um, it's not always clear that the people are being faithful to God, um, but 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 it's kind of sad. It's kind of sad and underwhelming. And I think that the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is characterized by this kind of ambiguity. It's not a shiny, happy story. It's not a victorious story in every way. Um, but, but here is exactly where this book points to Christ, I would argue, uh, because, um, as we're going to see later, while the Old Covenant, and when I say Old Covenant, that's synonymous with the phrase Old Testament. While the Old Covenant is ambiguous, um, the New Covenant is not. And I would also say that the, new, that, that, the, that the ambiguity of the Old Covenant points to 
the paradoxicalness, the paradox of the new covenant. Um, the new covenant is not amb ambiguous. It's not, it's not called into question that Jesus Christ won the victory. No, it's not ambiguous at all. Um, however, it's still kind of strange. It's not ambiguous, but it's paradoxical. Um, Martin Luther talks about the hiddenness of God. Um, um, the victory of the cross and the victory of Christ is something that is only perceivable by faith. So it's not ambiguous, but it is paradoxical. And so I think that in, in a way, the, the ambiguity of the old covenant points forward to the paradox of the new. But we'll talk about that more uh, as we continue. Look with me at this second uh, part, uh, the second section here, introduction. And y'all, really, I want to introduce today's lesson like this. Um, I want to introduce today's lesson, which is Ezra 4 through 10. I want to introduce things um, by drawing your attention to the law, the Torah. Um, you know, it, one, one, of, one of my personal prayer practices is I love to read and to meditate on the Psalms. Um, Honestly, the Book of Common Prayer in the Psalter, the Psalms of David has a, a 30 day cycle, which has meant a whole lot to me. It's meant the world to me. Um, over the last couple of years, I've been praying the 30 day Psalter. Uh, that's been the backbone of my prayer life, both individually as well as with my family over the last year or two. And, and I'm always struck when I come around to Psalm 119. Um, by the way, today, the morning prayer uh, today, on day 25, the day I'm recording this, is Psalm 119, a, a section of Psalm 119. And I'm always struck by Psalm 119 and the way that it talks about God's law. And it says things like, um, I meditate on your law. Your, your law is life, O Lord. Lord, help me to delight in your law. All of this lofty, wonderful language about the law, the Torah of God, and it really has caused me over the, over the last few months to sort of go back and, and be like, what is this law that, that the psalmist is talking about, this law that is so wonderful, this law that we are supposed to live by, this law which is uh, the pathway of our life? What is this law? And y'all, um, this forced me to go back to the book of Exodus. And I think that I kind of had an epiphany, a personal epiphany, which has meant so much um, in the book of Exodus, if you, if you ask the question, what is this law? What is this law that the psalmist is constantly talking about? I think that you can put your finger on it um, in Exodus 19, right after the people are delivered from Egypt, they cross the Red Sea. This is one of the first things that happens after that. And uh, God, or Moses is, is having an encounter with God and God says this to Noah, and I would like to propose to you that this is the Torah, the law in a nutshell, okay? This is chapter 19 of Exodus, verses four through six. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and, bore, uh, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. I find those lines that God speaks to Moses unspeakably wonderful. Um, they're filled with poetic imagery. Um, I think that they convey and evoke the intimacy that God desires with his people, that God desires with his creation, uh, which is also the intimacy that Adam experienced with God in Eden. Um, and really the bottom line is f in terms of what God's people are supposed to do, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to obey God's voice. We're supposed to listen to God and to obey his voice. That's really the law in a nutshell. Now look with me at the outline here. 
question. What if God's people had actually kept the law, right? Think about uh, the Ten Commandments. Think about God's law being delivered to the people of Israel in the book of Exodus and also in the book of Deuteronomy. What if God's people had, had actually kept the law? What if they had, what if we had obeyed God's voice and lived in intimacy and humble, simple dependence on God? What would have happened had we actually kept the law? Well, eventually God's goodness would have flooded the earth and Eden would, would have been restored. Eden would have been restored. What do I mean by Eden? I mean intimacy with God. Uh, I mean that human beings would, would have continuously, would have continuously been experiencing God's holistic intimacy and peace. Uh, that's what would have happened has got, had God's people kept the law. So the whole purpose of the law is to restore God's people, to restore humanity, to restore the human race, to restore creation. The whole purpose of the law is to restore us to intimacy with God. But look with me at the outline here. Of course, human beings are not able to keep the law. Um, neither Jew nor Gentile is able to keep the law. That's what Romans 1 and 2 is about. And therefore, bad things happen to Israel, and the result is a big mess, right? This is the story of the Old Testament. Uh, you might say beginning with the erection and the construction of the golden calf, right? That idol that Israel constructed right after the, they received the Ten Commandments, um, Israel disobeys. Uh, and the result is a big mess. And here's what I want to say to you right now. The story of Ezra and Nehemiah is a part of that big mess, okay? Um, now, the mess is not all bad. God is at work in the mess. Um, absolutely. Um, God is bringing about his purposes in the midst of the mess. That is absolutely true. But it's still a big mess. Uh, it's, it, it's still a big mess. Now, the ministry of Jesus is not a big mess. Uh, the, the cross and the resurrection, what we call the Paschal mystery, the death and resurrection of Christ, that is not a big mess. Even the book of Acts, I would say, is not a big mess. Very, very interesting. Um, but in the old covenant, the story of Israel is a big mess. Now, God is still at work. God is still bringing about his purposes. God is still paving the way for the Messiah. That's one of the huge points. And Ezra and Nehemiah is a part of that whole story, but in a way it is a big mess. And so it's not surprising that we, that we would see lots of ambiguity in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. I think that the ambiguity though is a bit more pointed and, and a bit more pronounced and, and a bit more interesting in such a way that it clearly points to Jesus. Um, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is a massive reminder to us that apart from Christ, we have no, no hope. Apart from Christ, Israel had no hope. Israel was not able to keep the law. Israel was not able to listen to God's voice. Israel was not able to live in intimacy with God over and over and over again. Israel keeps tripping himself up and bad things continue to happen. And Ezra and Nehemiah is a part of that, okay? Now, y'all, what I want to do today, that was sort of my introduction, a little bit of review and also introduction. Um, I've been talking for about, um, about 17 minutes. What I want to do real quick is to go through a quick summary of chapters 4 through uh, 10. And these are just things that, that jumped out at me that I thought would be worth discussing. So look with me at chapter four. I'm just going to read some stuff. The plot thickens. Okay, so last time, remember our little summary of last time. Last time we saw the return of the exiles to Jerusalem, the erection of the altar and the initial temple itself, and then an ambiguous response. We saw uh, those things last time, right? So this time the plot thickens. The plot thickens beginning in chapter four, uh, in the form of threatened contamination. Now, I think that contamination is a huge issue that gets raised in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. 
uh, the question is, how are, how are we to think about the purity of the people of God, the purity of Israel slash the church? How are we to think about Israel, the community of God's people being contaminated? Listen to verses, uh, uh, chapter four, verses one through three. Now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he mocked the Jews. He said in the presence of his associates and then and in the army of Samaria. Y'all, I want you to circle that word Samaria. Very important word for our study in this book. He said uh, in the presence of the army of Samaria, what are, these free, what are these feeble Jews doing? What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore things? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones? out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that. Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, that stone wall they are building, any fox going up on it would break it down. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their taunt back on their own heads and give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt. Do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight for they have hurled insults in the face of the builders. Okay, y'all, what we see in those verses, who is the Sanballat guy in, in verse one? He is, uh, he is a person, let's, I, you know what? I think we should just call him a Samaritan. He is someone who uh, has, has, has always been in the land. He never went into exile. Uh, he's always been in the land. He probably thinks of himself as some sort of Jewish person. Uh, he might be from some of the more northern regions, north of Judea. Uh, but this is someone who has already been in the land. And what's happening is that as the exiles are returning to Jerusalem, they're threatened by these other natives um, who, who never went into exile, basically. And as we're going to see later, this is very, very relevant to the ministry of Jesus that we see in the Gospels, right? Um, look with me at the outline. These folks write a letter of complaint to Ahasuerus. Uh, then they write a letter of complaint to Artaxerxes. These are two kings, uh, two Persian kings. And Artaxerxes temporarily stops construction of the temple. So this is kind of a real bummer from the perspective of Ezra and, Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel. Um, the people have to stop their construction. God's people have to stop their construction because Artaxerxes makes that ruling. Why does he make that ruling? He makes that ruling in response to some complaints uh, that, were, that, were issue, that, 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 that were submitted to him by these neighbors of Jerusalem that have that have been in the land the whole time. Um, Y'all think about this. Think think about this in terms of the Samaritans of Jesus's day. Okay. Um, the Samaritans are mentioned many times in. Uh, or, or, or Samaria, rather, is mentioned many times in the book, including in um, chapter 4, verse 17. Let's keep reading. It would be a mistake to apply this exclusionary attitude simply and directly to our own day. Um, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that, that a huge issue in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is the relationship of the people, God's holy people, the relationship between them and the outsiders. And what we're going to see is that in general, the attitude of, of, of the leaders, the attitude of Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel is one of exclusion. Um, in other words, they, 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 they just, they basically block out. They say, talk to the hand. <laughs> they say, you will have no part in our life. That's their attitude toward these outsiders. I'm calling that an exclusionary attitude. Now, am I saying that they were wrong to have that attitude? No, that would be an oversimplification of what I'm saying, but I am saying that, that it's ambiguous um, and it's complicated. 
And it would be a mistake to apply this exclusionary attitude simply and directly to our own day as if that's what the church is supposed to do, as if that's what the church is supposed to do, to look at outsiders and say, stay out. No, no nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the church is not supposed to have that attitude toward outsiders. And by the way, the United States is not supposed to have that attitude to outsiders. Uh, that interpretation would be to bypass Christ. That interpretation would be to try to read the Old Testament independently of Christ and to forget about Christ as we read the Old Testament. And that's a grave mistake. If we do that, my claim is that the Old Testament falls apart and it makes no sense. And it's easily turned into a weapon and something that is destructive to God's people and to the world, okay? Let's look at chapter five now. Yet another letter is written. And I don't think it's a second letter. I think it's a third letter. But I'm going to say an additional letter is written um, by these neighbors, these contaminating neighbors of Jerusalem. An additional letter is written by them, this time to King Darius, seeking to verify the Jews' claim concerning Darius's decree granting them permission to rebuild the temple. Uh, and I think that, that should say Cyrus, um, seeking to verify the Jews' claim concerning Cyrus's decree, granting them permission to rebuild the temple. Okay, I hope that makes sense. If you read Ezra 5, then it should make sense. Note that in 512, the reason for the initial destruction of the temple is given, disobedience. Let me read 512. Um, then they, then they said, oh gosh, um, I don't think that's 512 somewhere, um, in this context, it is stated that the reason the initial temple of Solomon was destroyed is because God's people were disobedient. I don't think it's 512. Sorry about that. I'll fix it later. Uh, look with me at Roman numeral three, Ezra six. Uh, Darius does respond to this letter that he receives, King Darius does, and he consults the annals, very interesting, um, and he does that uh, in the capital of the province of Media. I, I find this mention of Media very uh, interesting. Um, sometimes you hear about the Persian Empire referred to as the Medo-Persian Empire, and that's because of this city of Media. Um, Darius locates the record of Cyrus's to decree to rebuild the temple. Darius responds to Tatanai, and he's the one who wrote this letter. Uh, he responds to Tatanai, leave the Jews alone, let them continue to rebuild. Tatanai obeys the king, very interesting. Um, Tatanai is, uh, is portrayed as someone, is, and not, a, not a completely bad guy. Um, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah are mentioned again. That's very interesting. Um, I find it fascinating how so many times in the Bible we read scripture with scripture. So, for example, if you want to understand what the prophets are talking about, you can look at the historical narrative going on, and it makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like um, you can read the book of Acts in conjunction with the letters of Paul and you can tell, you can get a lot of context that way. So it's very interesting that the prophets Haggai and Zechariah are mentioned uh, in this book. Um, next, the construction of the temple. The temple is, is often called the house of the Lord, the house of God that is completed in 615. Uh, and then there's this wonderful dedication ceremony. It's a beautiful image. Um, the regular functioning of the temple is reestablished. Keep in mind that this would have been the temple that Jesus Christ loved. This would have been the temple that Jesus worshiped in. This would have been the temple that Jesus had zeal for, so much so that he went in and he cleaned, he, 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 he angrily and wrathfully um, kicked out the bad guys and cleansed the temple, right? This is that temple. It's amazing. So you see, that's a huge connection between this book of Ezra and Nehemiah on the one hand and Christ on the other. Um, and what we see in this chapter is that the regular functioning of the temple is reestablished 
and the Passover is celebrated with joy. So I'm, one of my big um, refrains in this class is that the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is ambiguous, but in that, ambigu in that ambiguity, there is much goodness, right? Even in the midst of what I've called the mess, there's still real joy, uh, real faithfulness, real ex a real experience of the kingdom of God and God's, God's goodness, right? Look with me at chapter seven. Now we are in the reign, the reign of King Artaxerxes. Um, I wanna show you a book real quick. I wanna show you a book that I ordered off of Amazon this last week, inspired by this class and inspired by this material in Ezra and Nehemiah. This is called Persian Fire. It's by a really wonderful author named Tom Holland. Tom Holland. Uh, Tom Holland. Um, his latest book is called Dominion. It's a bestseller. He's an amazing writer. He's kind of like Thomas Cahill. Uh, in the sense that he writes on a popular level, but it's also extremely responsible uh, in a scholarly way. Now, I actually think that Tom Holland is better than uh, Thomas Cahill, but for those of you who've read books like um, How the Irish Saved Civilization, I think that you would love Tom Holland. And this, this is a book about the Persian Empire, which, um, which basically had a massive decades long confrontation with Athens and with Greek civilization. Um, it, it's a fascinating history. Maybe you've heard about the Peloponnesian Wars. Uh, those are very uh, relevant for understanding ancient philosophy like Plato and Aristotle. Um, anyway, that's Tom Holland. The point is uh, what, what, what prompted that digression is that we read about Artaxerxes um, in um, well, in, in the, in, in the, uh, Apocrypha slash Deuterocanon, I mentioned that last time, especially first Maccabees, but also, um, in, in secular history, like Thucydides, I think definitely in Herodotus, it's a big link up between the Bible on the one hand and the, uh, the, the, the classical world of Greek antiquity, what is some kind, sometimes called Hellenism on the other, okay? So really interesting stuff in my opinion. Now y'all in chapter seven, Ezra is finally introduced. Do y'all remember what the three big Jewish leaders are in this book of Ezra and Nehemiah? First, you've got Zerubbabel and what did he build? He built the temple. Then you've got Ezra and what did Ezra build? Ezra built a renewed faithfulness to the law, okay? Zerubbabel's project was the physical construction of the temple. Ezra's project was the spiritual construction of a renewed appreciation of the law in the lives and hearts of the people. Thirdly, Nehemiah's project was the walls of the city. So you could say that the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, you could say that it's about temple, heart, and walls. Very interesting, right? But now we're introduced to Ezra. This is in chapter seven. And it's very interesting how he is described. It says that he's skilled in the law of Moses. It says that he found favor with the king. That would be Darius, I think. Or no, that would be Artaxerxes. Uh, it says that he was a priest. Very interesting. Um, and it says that he was a man of the heart. Verse 10. I'd like to read that. Um, Ezra 7.10. Gosh, that's incorrect again. I don't know what's going on. And it says that Ezra was, was a man of the heart. Y'all, I might have my uh, chapters off. That's very embarrassing, but oh well, please have mercy on me. Oh, I'm sorry. I was in the book of Nehemiah. Ezra 7.10. Ezra 7.10. Ah, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of God. Did you know that the law of God is something that pertains to our hearts? We don't obey the law of God out of duty. We obey the law of God out of the heart. And that, that goes back to Psalm 119 that I was talking about earlier, right? So Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach the statues 
statutes and ordinances to Israel. Amazing. That's Ezra 710. Next bullet point, King Artaxerxes gives a letter of permission and protection to Ezra for his journey to Jerusalem. Uh, so, so this is a second wave of folks that are, that are going back to Jerusalem from Persia um, for a second project. The project this time is the, the inculcation of the law, right? Um, next bullet point. Um, this is very interesting. There's kind of like a, a soliloquy or, or an aside, um, which is a discourse of praise and gratitude to God. And one of the things that I find interesting, and this is in uh, verse 27 of chapter 7 and following, is that Ezra is speaking in the first person. It's very interesting. Um, I, you, don't, you don't hear that kind of thing, this first person soliloquy, this first person monologue. You don't find that in the, in the Pentateuch or in the historical books of Joshua, Judges, First and Second Kings, etc. No, but you find it here in Ezra. I, I find that very interesting. Um, this is connected to what I mean when I say that it seems to me that, that these books of Ezra and Nehemiah, this book, we find in it something like a heightened consciousness. Um, last bullet point for chapter seven, when, when, when the text describes the king's love for Ezra, it uses the word chesed. That word chesed uh, means loving kindness or covenant love. Uh, that word pops up in the Psalms over and over again. Sometimes it's called the steadfast love of the Lord. That's an amazing word. I mean, what, what, what the text is saying is that this, this is a, an amazing king. Um, this king uh, is finding favor in the, the eyes of God's people. It's amazing. That's Artaxerxes. Very, very interesting. Look with me at chapter 8. I'm just going to go quickly through this. Ezra gathers a small army of leaders. I think that one of the sub-themes of Ezra and Nehemiah is the topic of leaders. Um, he gathers a small army of le leaders to head to Jerusalem. He recruits a number of Levites. Remember Levites, the sons of Aaron, um, or Aaron is one, is one of the sons of Levi. Um, the Levites um, were the priestly class, right? Um, Third bullet point, he sets up uh, camp at the river Ahava to fast and pray. They have a covenant renewal service and donate a lot of gold, et cetera, for temple use. Keep in mind, this is before they get to Jerusalem. This is, this is en route to Jerusalem, camping out by the river. Um, again, in verse 28 of this chapter, chapter 8, a theme that I've drawn attention to before, there's this juxtaposition between the holy items of the temple, knives, pots, pans, vessels, furniture, and the holy people of God. Very, very interesting. Never forget that you and I are furniture in the temple of God. We're living stones of the temple. That's in verse 28. Next bullet point, uh, Ezra and his leaders, they decide to forego any arms or, or, or ordinary protection for their trip. Um, once they arrive at the temple, they offer sacrifices and renew covenant again. Look with me at chapter nine. Ezra is notified that many of the people have, okay, so, so what's going on is that Ezra and his people, they're going back to Jerusalem to inculcate the law of God into the people's hearts and lives. They finally arrive and they're shocked. They're shocked and overwhelmed and, and horribly uh, um, disturbed. Uh, and bothered and saddened by what they see. Now, I'm sure it didn't shock them completely because they'd probably heard about this when they were in Persia, but when they see it with their own eyes, they're shocked and they're distressed because what they realize is that many of the people have mixed their holy seed with the peoples of the lands, right? Um, and, and here we begin to encounter the issue of marital purity. Basically, the men of Israel have been um, joining with, with, with heathen women uh, and marrying them and taking their wives, the, their daughters as their own wives. Uh, and this is a horrible violation of God's law, according to Ezra. So Ezra sits appalled. He tears his hair from his head and his beard, pours sackcloth and ashes over him. He begins to fast. 
Um, I think it's interesting that in the midst of this, of his prayer, Ezra says that even in their restoration, the Jews are nevertheless slaves. This, this is another connection to the time of Jesus. Um, Y'all, if, if the people of Israel, if the people of Jerusalem and Judea were slaves under the reign of the Persians, well, then guess what? They were also slaves under the reign of the Romans, okay? I said in the last class that the Hasmonean dynasty was, was, the, was only the second time other than David and Solomon, basically, the, 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 the monarchy, that Israel had home rule. Um, the, the second and final time that Israel had home rule and was not under the lordship of a foreign ruler, a foreign empire, the second and last time that that happened was after Ezra and Nehemiah, but before Christ. It's called the Hasmonean dynasty. It gets kicked off with the revolt of the Maccabeans that we read about in, for, in, in the books of the Maccabeans. Um, and so you see, there's a parallel between the situation of Ezra and Nehemiah and the situation of Jesus. In both cases, they are slaves. It's important to remember that the people of Jesus, Jesus's people, the Jews, the Israelites, the people that he encounters, the disciples, they are slaves because they are under the heavy hand of the Romans, not the, the, the Persians, but the Romans. And while there are lots of differences between the Persians and the Romans, there's also a lot of similarities, right? So the Jews are nevertheless slaves. Even though they're allowed now to occupy their own land, they're still the slaves of a, of, of a Gentile overlord. Ezra prays to God, pleading to help, pleading for help in this situation of contamination. Uh, God's people are being contaminated because they are uh, having sex and being married and having children with um, Gentile people. So Ezra comes in and he brings judgment to the people, right? And the people join Ezra in his weeping and penitence and the people repent. Uh, there's a covenant renewal service that happens uh, as a part of this repentance uh, and now things get a little difficult from, from our point of view, from the point of view of, of modern Western Christians. They do get a little difficult and, and, and uh, we need to be careful here. We need to be, we need to resist the temptation just to throw the Bible under the bus and think that our modern Western secular perspective is above critique. Uh, no way is that the case. But it still seems problematic, I would, I would suggest, because what happens here in chapter 10 is that these foreign wives and their children are rejected. Um, there, there's a process of legal adjudication that's set up, and it's decided that all of these Gentile wives um, that had become joined to Jewish husbands have to be banished from, from the city. They have to be rejected and cast out. Um, and that takes place by way of a process of legal adjudication, okay? Now, note that some of the leaders opposed this approach. So there again, I think that we find a little bit of ambiguity even in the text. Um, th this is an unworkable situation, I, I would argue. I would argue that, that, that this situation, this mess that the, that, that the people are in, uh, there, there are no solutions to this mess aside from Christ. That is what I think, okay? Do I think that Ezra is a good guy? Yes. Do I think that Ezra should be given a high five in the main for what he's doing? Yes. But I also think that he is a, 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 a monument. He is a monument and a signpost and a pointer to the fact that apart from Christ, under the situation of the law, there are no solutions to the mess that sinful Israel and sinful humanity have gotten ourselves into. There's no way out of this pickle that we are in aside from Christ. I think that that's definitely going on in this story. And I think that the ambiguity that we see in, in, in this opposition from some of the leaders is a hint of that, okay? Uh, in 1044, all the foreign women and children are finally sent away. <sighs> Rough, rough stuff, um, problematic stuff, I would argue. Um, 
And I hope that I'm making sense. Y'all, I want to conclude like this. Look with me at Z on the outline. First off, letter A. In the old covenant, we find ambiguity, but in the new covenant, we find paradox. Remember, I'm arguing that, that what we see in the death and resurrection of Christ, the paschal mystery of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God that he brings in, it's not ambiguous. It's not partly crappy. It's not partly disappointing. It's, it's totally victorious, but it is paradoxical. It's not super clear. I, what I mean is it's not the way we want it all the time. We still have to walk by faith and not by sight. And, and it's paradoxical in that way. Okay. Look with me at B. Um, I think that this ambiguity, it can be, it, it's unclear to, to the people who wrote the book of Ezra Nehemiah, but it's clear to us. They don't, I, I would argue that, that they don't know how to make sense of it, but we do, okay? Because take, for example, the ambiguity around the temple, which is what I'm referring to here in the verses of 3, 12 to 13, when those elders look at the temple and they're underwhelmed and they're disappointed, um, that's gotta be really disturbing to an old covenant Jewish person. For example, it had, it, that had to, to have been disturbing for the people in the, in the Maccabean times. Uh, but y'all, it's not disturbing for us in the same way because we know that it points to Christ. It points to Christ who is the new and final temple as we read about in John chapter two, okay? Um, how does the book of Ezra and Nehemiah point forward to Christ? I think that's how. It, the, the ambiguity contained in it reminds us that, 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 the, that the, the predicament in which we find ourselves is unworkable and unsolvable apart from Christ, okay? And y'all, that's it for me. Um, your homework for next time, next Sunday, third Sunday of Lent, is to read Nehemiah 1 through 7. I'm very excited about this. Um, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for these wonderful friends. Be with them this week as they journey through Lent. I pray that you would give us a holy Lent. I pray that you would cause us to see that our weakness is actually the pathway to our victory because it's our weakness, Lord, that causes us to cast ourselves on you, our only hope. Thank you for these friends. Thank you for the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Peace, I will see y'all next Sunday.